When my nine-year-old daughter memorized the Ten Commandments, she was pretty excited to say them to me. I sat on the edge of her bed and she made her way through that list. When she was finished, I thought, you know, this is probably a good opportunity for a teachable moment. And so I said to her, Morgan, have you ever broken one of the Ten Commandments? She gave me this shy smile, reluctant to answer that question. I said, Morgan, have you ever lied? She nodded. I said, Morgan, have you ever not honored your mom and dad? We both knew the answer to that question. That was really more of a rhetorical question. I kept pressing. I said, Morgan, I know you've never murdered anyone, but have you ever hated someone in your heart? And she was ready to put an end to this interrogation. And so here's what she said. She said, Dad, I know one commandment I've never broken. I've never made for myself an idol in the form of anything. I resisted the temptation to explain to her that this is the one commandment we've broken more than all the others. Martin Luther said, really, you can't break any of the other commandments without first breaking that one. But I began to wonder how many people would make the same assumption as my daughter. that They don't assume they struggle with idolatry because idolatry seems like this antiquated issue for superstitious primitives. It just doesn't have much relevance today. But there's a reason why this is the most talked about problem in all of Scripture. It's because for most of us, idolatry is the issue. Who or what we worship is what we live for. And that determines everything. As a pastor, besides struggling with my own sins, I often talk to people who have their own struggles. When I hear about their struggles, my first instinct is to just call it what it is and say, well, that's a sin and you need to stop. But what I've discovered is that if you dig deeper, underneath that sin struggle is always idolatry. That there is this tangible sin that is the fruit, but idolatry is always the root. I always had this incredible desire to prove myself and to do some good. I was an idealist. And uh, I was, I guess you would say, on the fast track to success. The poor kid grows up, uh, gets all the breaks, and ends up in the office next to the President of the United States. I remember thinking when I got out of school and sort of began the workaday life, uh, what do you do that really uh, defines you? And it seemed the most logical thing was to try to become as successful as possible in the business world. Who we are and what we do comes down to this issue of idolatry. In the Old Testament book of Joshua, we meet Joshua at the end of his life in chapter 24. He's had a full life. He was with Moses when they led the Israelites out of Egypt. He watched the walls of Jericho fall. He led the people of God into the land of Canaan. And now, at the end of his life, he's about 110 years old. And he gathers the people together for what will be his last recorded words to them. And here's what he says. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And then he says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. He tells the people to decide what gods they will worship. But notice one option that is conspicuously absent. Joshua does not say, or you could choose to worship nothing at all. Because the truth is, everyone worships something. It's hardwired into our DNA. You could parachute into the deepest jungles of South America to people who had never made contact with the outside world, and you would find that they worship a god or many gods. You could jet into the heart of culture, New York or Paris, and you would find that even the elite worship something, money, power, status, intelligence. See, you may not be a Christian, but you still worship a God. Worshiping nothing is not an option. My mom's from a, a country family, and food was thought about as, wasn't really thought about. You know, it was one of those things, if it feels good, you just sort of do it and it was all about enjoyment. There was no discussion about nutrition. There was none of that kind of thing. 
I experienced sexual abuse, which was um, very confusing. Ever since I was little, I longed to be a boy, and I really rejected my gender. And I think a really core belief that came out of that struggle for me uh, was I really felt like a mistake, like I was trapped in the wrong body. A mistake. I was raised the son of a pastor in a small Pentecostal church. Uh, the de denomination was really legalistic. Uh, God seemed to be a person who was trying to send me to hell all the time. Everything seemed to be wrong. God was a list of things you can't do, and I didn't want any part of it, I, especially as a teenager. It wasn't so bad when I was a kid, but as a teenager, I really started rebelling, uh, not wanting to be part of this bunch of hypocrites. Joshua says you need to make a choice. The first option was for the people to worship the gods of their fathers, which is what we often do. We worship work because dad worshiped work. We worship money because mom worshiped the money. And many of us dedicate our lives to the gods of our fathers. I can remember sitting on the back porch of our home on Sunday afternoons, which was the only time I got with my dad, because he was in school every night and working all day. And he would teach me always do a good day's work for a good day's pay. And that was drilled into me. There was still a lot that ethic in America, that ethic that hard work and you can get ahead, a great land of opportunity. And I would come home every day, um, could not wait to get home, um, and um, usually tormented from the bus stop to my house by whatever kids in the neighborhood. And when I got there, my mom would have some kind of food fixed. I don't care what it was, um, but it made everything okay. And my mom did the only thing she knew to do, which was to feed me. Next, Joshua speaks of the gods of the Canaanites and the Egyptians. And these are the gods of their culture. Sometimes turn on the television and just pay attention to the advertising, because businesses will try to sell their product by attributing God characteristics to it. If you listen close, it sounds like they're trying to sell a savior. If you're unhappy, bored, depressed, just buy this and be saved from your unhappiness. If you just eat at this restaurant, then you'll be satisfied. If you don't order this right now, then you're going to miss out. And our entire economy is based on the fact that we're idolaters. And of course, something doesn't have to be evil or wrong to be a false god. And some of these things are very good things, but here's what can subtly happen. A good thing can become a God thing. And we were able to present our business plan to 1,500 people in a venture capital forum about six months after we launched the company. And money started chasing us. And I became very, very caught up in this. It not only uh, served to make me feel successful, it also started to make me feel um, significant. A pattern from my abuse taught me to not have healthy relations um, with the opposite sex. And there was a really strong belief that rooted in me from that experience, and that is I am not valuable. What I didn't know was that I was created for love. I was created to to be loved extravagantly and to, and to love others. I started to feel this, this desperation that I needed to, to fill this desire to be acceptable, to be loved, to, to be okay. So I'm living this life, going to Tuesday morning Bible studies and prayer meetings with the men of the church. And, in the meantime, we'd brought a computer into our house and I'd discovered internet porn. And so I want us to spend some time identifying some of the gods at war in our lives. I, I know that most of us are reluctant to admit a problem here. We're quick to say, I don't have any idols that I'm worshiping in my life. But I want to ask you some questions. These are questions that a counselor friend of mine asked me a few years ago. 
And I found that my honest but reluctant answers revealed some of the gods that were winning the war in my heart. And so as I ask these questions, just answer them as honestly as possible. Question number one. What has left you feeling the most disappointed? When we feel overwhelmed with disappointment, it's often because of idolatry. We've made something more important than it should be. We've put our hope in something other than God. So are you disappointed with your financial status or your children or your sex life or your marriage? One indicator of your disappointment is what you complain about. Our complaining often reveals an idol in our life. I began to, to worship these other attempts in my life to try to grasp a sense of love and acceptance. So I didn't know how to have a healthy relationship with a boy or a guy. Um, very physical and, and sexualized. And with the girls, I didn't know how to relate to them. That is when they started to become the mystery for me. That's when attraction started for me with the same sex, and that's when my pornography started. Question two, what do you sacrifice your time and money for? The word serve appears seven times in verses 14 and 15, and serving in Joshua's day was more than just time, it was finances as well, your income, livestock, produce. So where's the first place your paycheck goes to? A huge house, a car payment, special education for the kids. See, our biggest investments are oftentimes our most sacred idols. I got completely pulled into this vortex of defining my life by the success of this company. And I would come home from the office, I would get back on the phone, I would get back on the internet, and I would work, 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 work. Question three, what do you worry about? What scares you? What are you the most terrified of losing? Maybe you fear not reaching a certain level of success, people not liking you. Maybe it's being alone. These things have the potential to become our idols because in them we find our meaning, our significance, sometimes our very identity. And I started thinking that I could, I could really make a living in this. Um, I, I bet I could, I could produce this, and what better job to be paid to be around naked girls all the time. So I would, I would start shooting porn part-time behind my wife's back. And I did that for three years. It's not like she didn't know something was wrong. She just didn't know what. I was always afraid that I'd be caught. Question four. Where do you go when you're hurt and you need comfort? Theologian Henry Blackaby defines an idol as anything you turn to for help instead of first turning to God. It might be food, it might be sex, it might be a relationship, but where we go for comfort often reveals what God is winning the war. And I didn't know how to deal with how I felt, but I knew how to feel good. And so I would eat. The more rejection I had, the more I would eat. And this continued for years. So be desperate enough to attach yourself to this and try to get intimacy here. Try to get connection here. Try to get love here. Try to feel something here. And that was in secret. Nobody knew of that struggle. The fantasy never satisfied. They never satisfied. But even as a porn producer, I knew that. In fact, I used to specifically target Christian audiences when I would look for people to come visit the websites that I built. I knew that Christians would click through at a higher percentage. It was true. It was a well-known fact in the industry uh, where Christians are looked at as the biggest hypocrites on earth. But when you keep something a secret, it becomes a bigger issue. The more that you hide it, the stronger it becomes. Question five, what makes you mad? Have you ever been surprised how something unexpected can make you angry? You lose your temper at a pickup basketball game. Your spouse disrespects you and you just start yelling. The money you were promised doesn't get paid and you lose control. Why? Could it be that the victory at the game or the respect from the spouse or money that you're owed 
means more than you thought? In 1971, on my 40th birthday, the Wall Street Journal did a front page piece about me. He interviewed someone who worked for me in the United States Senate and said, watch out, he's soft-spoken, but he's tough. So tough, he'd run over his own grandmother. And that, that made headlines thereafter. And even to this day, I'll see stories written about me that said, Chuck Colson, who once boasted he'd run over his own grandmother. That'll go to my tombstone, I'm afraid. Question six, what do you dream of? What are you the most passionate about? Maybe it's sports or decorating, maybe it's music or your appearance or work. Nothing wrong with those things necessarily, but is it possible that one of those things has become more important than God? Every goal was around money and my work and my net worth. I just didn't realize that I was willing to pay any price to accomplish those goals and that Christ was no longer on the radar. Whose encouragement means the most to you? You want your boss to call you in and say, we couldn't do this without you. You want your spouse to say, you are the husband, you're the wife I've always dreamed of having. You want your dad to say, I'm proud of you. Or you want your mom to say, you're doing a great job with your kids. And though we all want encouragement like that, it can end up being what we live for not God's, but someone else's approval and applause. I would look at them and say, oh, I long to, to be accepted by them. I long to be loved by them. And so I'm in this dichotomy and I'm longing to connect with the girls, but I'm hurting so much I didn't know how to do that. I was known as the former Marine captain, White House tough guy. Nixon said I'd walk through doors without opening them if I had to. And he was always saying, Chuck is the one guy that can get things done around here. He doesn't pay any attention to the bureaucracy. He just goes ahead and gets it done. And the more I thought about being successful or super successful in the eyes of other people, the harder I tried and the more I pushed and the more dedicated I was to, to the point that I, I, I recognized that I was out of control. And I was convinced it was sort of the perfect balanced portfolio. I had a little Jesus and a lot of money. So Joshua identifies these gods at war within us, and then he throws down this challenge. He says, choose this day whom you will serve. What's interesting is that the verb tense here implies more than just a one-time decision, as if you could cast a vote and then be done with it forever. Instead, when he says choose, it is a continuous action it's not this one big decision, but rather it is a decision that we make every day, many times a day, we choose to worship the Lord. In the second of the Ten Commandments, God says, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. You've probably heard that part before, but then it goes on to say, for the Lord your God is a jealous God. In other words, he's not interested in sharing the throne of your heart any more than your husband or wife would be okay with you dating around. So here's what God will do. He will often put himself in direct competition with these other idols that we worship, and he will say, you choose. You choose between me and money. You choose between me and sex. You choose between me and that relationship. You choose between me and that promotion. He doesn't give you the option of making him just one of many. I was looking in the mirror and I, I said some words that were along the lines of, God, I, 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 I don't know what to do anymore. I just, I, I quit. I just quit. And at that moment, I said, Lord, I don't even know what I need to do. How do I change? I knew it was going to be a lonely, depressing experience, but I felt free inside because I wanted to live my life only for the living God, the one true God. And that's when I cried out to God. That's when I said, you know, I don't know. I don't know if you're real. I don't know if this whole thing is legit. <laughs> All I know is that I need a God. I need a God to show me how to live. I need a God to save my life. Save my life. 
Don't dismiss Joshua's challenge as antiquated or irrelevant. The question still remains the same. Who will you serve? What God will you worship? The God of your fathers, the gods of your culture, or the one true God? There are gods at war, and the stakes couldn't be higher.